put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Scream 3 Movie Review It's 1999. We are no longer in a small town high school or a you know college. We are now in Hollywood. It's the, the sequel thing of making it bigger, but in this case they went too far, it's too big, it's just no longer relatable. Nevertheless, it you know, it is still a place where you should feel mostly safe, especially if you're somebody. And most of the characters in this are somebody. You know, there's security, bodyguards, you know, a lot of media attention. But of course, they're not necessarily actually safe. Stab 3 is in production, so we are literally watching the movie of them making the movie that we're watching, pretty much. And, you know, that is taking it to another level of, of this meta thing, but it, it, it does become too Hollywood-oriented, where, you know, before it was very specifically about you know, slashers especially, horror more in general, and now it's just too much about the filmmaking. It's it's maybe also a little too removed. It's it's harder to enjoy a film while, you know, we're constantly hearing about what it's like to make a film. It it becomes it's it's harder to lose yourself in the reality that the film is making. As more killings start, the the production of Stab 3 is looking like it might have to shut down. And the part of it is that Ghostface having, you know, the, the new Ghostface is indeed targeting the, yeah, the, the people working on it, and thus we meet some of the, you know, cast and crew of it, and in stark contrast to the first, and to some extent very distinctly different from the second, the characters here are thin, boring, uninteresting, undeveloped, and rather forgettable. You tend to forget them between the scene that they're introduced and then the next scene where they're important. And it's not even... they have some decent setups here. I wanna like these characters. The, the guy who's playing Dewey is this kind of, you know, snarky, cynical, and he's like, you know, when he meets Gail, he's like, you did a really nasty story about me, you know, and it's something like she wrote, you know, she, she broke the story of, or yeah, she, she covered the story of him, like, crashing his car. And apparently, like, in reality, it's that, like, someone, you know, there was something wrong with his brakes or something like that. And she insinuated that basically he was, you know, drunk and high and it was his own fault. And, and maybe even staged the crash rather than actually, and you know, right after vomiting that exposition upon us, he says, did you drive here? Are you parked nearby? Maybe I should check your brakes. You know, that's, yeah, I, I can, I can, that's, that's not bad of, of a character, and, you know, the, the, the Sydney, the, the Stab 3 Sydney is, yeah, there, it's no longer Tori Spelling. They, they do address that. They didn't retcon it. The, 
yeah, she's just kind of quiet and, you know, it's similar to how Sydney, you know, yeah, Sydney herself, kind of, you know, kind of quiet and, you know, seems nice and such. You know, it again, it's it's a decent character. The, the big problem with her character really is that with these more, you know, active and interesting characters, some of them at least are, she does kind of just disappear, you know, when when that type of character isn't the protagonist in a movie like this, she does kind of disappear. But yeah, there's, 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 there's stuff to work with here, and they just don't manage to. And of course, the survivors of the first two, you know, join the, you know, they, they, they do eventually all meet in Hollywood trying to figure out what's, you know, who the new killer is. And the, I'm not sure, I, I don't want to give away what it is, but it does appear that, excuse me, the killer is, that he has a pattern that he's following, and yeah, that's a, a decent, you know, it does end up being a little too vague, but it's, it's not too bad of a, and with this, it is, you know, a trilogy, a horror trilogy, which means that, you know, there's, you know, we're going back to the beginning, including bringing back supporting casts, like, some of them, like, blink and you'll miss, they're, they're, you know, but they are there, and it does, yeah, it, it ties very nicely into the first, and, you know, the things that you thought you knew all about are now brought into question and one way or the other this story is coming to an end the the killer isn't half bad and certainly you know the attacks themselves are you know some of them are decent the characters get especially stupid near the end and the, the climax. Honestly, the, the climax itself, at least elements of it, are really interesting. And they... I, I don't really have a problem with, like, the last... the last fourth of the movie or so, other than aforementioned, you know, they suddenly get really stupid, other than, largely, I don't have problems with the, the climax, and I, I honestly had forgotten that it's, it's one of the best parts of the film, and the, this is one where it gets really, Too, too ridiculous with the, you know, the, the entire series, all four of them have, you know, things where it's like, how could the, the killer possibly appear there, or, you know, how could he be so fast, or things like that, and in this one it just does go too far. There, there are parts of this that honestly, Yeah, it just, you, you stop believing the reality that it's supposed to be presenting. And it's, you know, a slasher comedy whodunit. And where the, the other three are tight, witty, fresh, clever, smart, hip, you know, with really compelling fourth wall breaks, yeah, this one, less so. Some have said it feels like Scooby-Doo more than Scream. It kind of does, yeah. I, you know, the moment that I read that as part of a, yeah, that's, that's really absolutely it. And this isn't even the one with Matthew Lillard. 
and where you know the entire series is you know has these homages to other slashers but here the elements that you know that were fresh before and that they you know did interesting things with you know sub tropes subverted have at this point you know and before the fourth one in in this they had become series trademarks so they're no longer really subverting expectations they're just meeting expectations it can be tense and there is still some satire again it's just mostly about filmmaking in general which doesn't really fit the rest of the series and it recreates parts of the first rather than merely referencing them where you know the it just the other three you know one two films one two and four do something interesting with the you know the element you know the first one they're completely new and two and four both have interesting new things to do with them and in this it just doesn't i mean the the recreations are some of the best parts of the film but that's because it is really just so you know yeah it's it's recreation of the first and we love the first so yeah and the script is just not as good you know I, I should note I have a number of problems with this film but I do not consider it to be just through and through terrible the you know they've yet to make a screen movie that isn't at least you know yeah this is this is watchable it's not too much more than watchable but you know for completists and such yeah now the writer was Aaron Kruger presumably hired despite his surname and really he was inexperienced at the time and he didn't really understand the series or the characters and that's it. I mean, the man did fantastic on the American Ring remake, you know, Arlington Road. I have no idea if he makes the Transformers movies any better or worse. But, yeah, I mean, the, the man does really have some good. I mean, I, I will admit I have not watched the original Ringu, but I have watched Ringo two, Ringu 2. And just... From that and from what I do know of Ringu, yeah, the, you know, the American The Ring is, you know, for sure it's a great film. I don't know for sure if it's, a, you know, if it's as good, if it lives up to the first one as far as remaking go. But, you know, so many foreign movies that do well are then remade in Hollywood and the ring is one of the ones that really really works it's and and yeah a ton of them really don't there were a lot of rewrites and reshoots and i'm i'm not going to go into detail about either but it does really show that a lot of it was just really up in the air you know more so than the second one and in that one, it was because of a leak. The at at this point, they didn't really have many points to make, especially again about slashers and horror in general. So it became Hollywood. And you know, when the first was made, they had a ton of points. When the second was made, they they still had points, and they you know you know this one really should be commenting on the whole trilogy thing. And it doesn't really, I mean, it fits when you just, when you watch it as a straight horror film and you just look at, it does use the rules, I said it before, 
at, you know, as stated in the film as well. But it doesn't really do that much to, like, s satirize them where the first one satirizes slashers, the second one sla you know, satirizes slasher sequels, the fourth one, you know, it's the, the reboot of, you know, a slightly older horror property. Yeah, just in this one, they did not really have that much to say, and I don't really have a problem. I, you know, I am interested in, in a Hollywood and filmmaking, but I don't really want it in a screen movie. I, you know, I would rather that the, the points made in this were just in a completely different movie, you know, one not at all tied to screen. Nevertheless, I have watched all four, and I love one, two, and four. The plot is convoluted when it was fairly straightforward in the first two, and in, yeah, largely in four as well. And it goes too far into, it, it almost becomes fantasy. There are just too many unexplained and inexplicable phenomena and ones that don't fit the series or the the slasher thing not not as the the others you know not as the first to establish this you know there there are fancy aspects in some you know in a number of slasher you know franchises but there wasn't really in scream before this one and the fourth one doesn't really have it either I don't know anything about the television show, and as for my background in slashers, I have watched the series of Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, Halloween, and I didn't know what you did last summer, and almost everything by John Carpenter. The opening... There are some interesting elements to it. It's again, like, the the... Yeah, the, the opening and the climax are... Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that the opening is particularly good, but there are interesting elements to it. And, yeah, just largely, the, the film overall doesn't really... I, I feel like maybe also focuses a little too much on you know, the, the characters going around trying to figure out what's going on. Maybe, yeah, that and that and the convoluted plot go hand in hand, of course. Yeah, it's... There aren't really... I mean, in the first two... I guess the... Yeah, I'm not even sure I can, I don't know, maybe it, you know, the running time or the, I can't quite put my finger on what the, the, the difference is, you know, it's also that in this, some of the time we don't really care about them, you know, trying to figure out what's going on, which is again in part because it's too convoluted, and that was really never the case in yeah, that's not the case in the other three. The It was never the case before, and it wasn't the case in the fourth one. In those, whenever they're trying to figure out what's going on, we're right there with them. We're also trying to figure out what's going on, and it remains interesting. And this does introduce one really bad ghost face element. The survivors of one and two, you know, Argon in the cast, and the characterization, the characterization of them at times is like insulting and inconsistent to the first two, and sometimes even to this. Martin Kincaid is a cop on the case played by Patrick Dempsey, and there's not that much, he's just, you know, he's a dog with a bone, he really wants to solve this. 
and you know Gail Withers is now one of you know a, a bigger lead than she was before you know still reporter she is she she wants to yeah she, I should start with, she's she's an anchor and she's like giving out you know huge you know giving these huge lectures on journalism and yeah it's you know she's she's a really big deal at this point you know her career has increased with each of yeah and the she's she's not as much of a strong female character as in the first two and in general yeah the the female characters in this just aren't as strong some of them are just straight up jokes really i you know and i already mentioned how you know the yeah i'll get to the I, yeah, I already mentioned the the one who plays Sydney in Staff Three. You know, she's not quite a joke, but she disappears into the which really, I mean, Sydney has a smaller role in this, but she never disappears. But yeah, then we have Dewey, the former deputy, now advisor to the film. You know, filming of Staff Three. He's, you know, very, very sweet and, you know, helpful guy. He is no longer with Gale. He is instead with the, the woman who plays Gale. And the, yeah, the, the relationship between Dewey and Gale continue to be one of the best elements, you know, in all four, there is one of the best elements. And in this, given that there is less Sydney, that element gets more focus. And it's, you know, it really says a lot that now that he's no longer with the real Gale, he's with the Step 3 Gale. And the, the two Gales together are quite good. I mean, you, you know, it gets too comedic for, you know, some of us, but it's a pretty well done element. You know, they they do have great chemistry, and they you know they're both really trying to figure out what's going on. And you know, Stab Three Gale is this. You know, like she says, she spent two movies in you know in in this role, and she feels like she really knows. Gale, and she's she's like a you know a crazy method actor or something. I'm not saying that method actors are crazy, but she's supposed to be kind of you know out there with all with all respect to you know actual mental illness. But yeah, and it's it's you know gale gets on other people's nerves and stab three gale gets on gale's nerves so it's you know yeah there's there's some really fun stuff there and it anyway dewey is played by david arquette and the i realize i did not mention gale is played by courtney cox and the stab three gale is played by Parker Posey and she you know I've seen her in some other stuff you know she she is great in comedy she really has the timing and you know and I've I've heard said that she knows that the the movie itself is bad and she plays it just right I I don't really know what they're. I I don't see it, but I can imagine they're right. I I don't. I don't necessarily disagree with it, for for sure. And that brings us to Sydney, 
no longer our lead. She didn't want to be in. There was also like scheduling conflicts. You know, sweet, smart. You know, and yeah, it's it's clear from right from the start that she is again being targeted. You know, it's the the killer is killing people. You know, working on stat three. But he's also looking for Sydney, and it's it's almost like this kind of thing of you know I will keep killing until I find her. So yeah, she is now a crisis counselor for abused for an abused women's hotline, which is obviously Miss Andrews. What about men? And she lives in a secluded rural house, and. When Ghostface, in fact, gets the number to, yeah, to call her, yeah, she, you know, they keep pulling her back in. And she's played once again by Neb Campbell. And we also do have Cotton Weary, who, you know, now has been years since he was exonerated by, of, for the murder of Sydney's mother and you know in the second one he was trying to become famous now he you know he did make it he's like you know he's this host of this you know I think it's like it's, you know nationally syndicated talk show or something called a hundred percent cotton yeah and you know played again by Liev Schreiber and Patrick Warburton plays a bodyguard, and yeah, he he gets to do that amazing, you know, underplayed, you know, very straight kind of with where it's it's really mostly just his voice and some his face that's doing all the acting. And yeah, I mean, he doesn't have a ton of screen time, but he's great. He's he's quite funny in it. And like nobody gives Dewey any respect. And you know, Patrick Warburton is the bodyguard for Stab Three Gale. And yeah, he's you know, so the two of them, you know, sometimes, you know, have conversations because of that, you know, and he's like, yeah, I've actually been a bodyguard for famous people. You're not even a cop anymore. Let's try this my way. And yeah. And we, they do work in a Randy cameo, and I won't give away how. And the I, I don't particularly know these actors from much else as has been the case with the first two and, and the fourth one actually we do get a little bit more great ghost face dialogue it's you know really right after the 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 way he was introduced in the first one you we want more of that but we can't really get it because the moment that people know, you know, the moment that you know that the, the voice of Ghostface belongs to a killer, the, the moment that someone's on the phone with him, either they quickly find out that he's a killer or it's just us waiting t for the character to realize that that's a killer, you know, it's the... It's that difficult thing of, of balancing in a horror movie. Yeah, it's, it's maybe especially slashers. The moment that the killer has been established, you still want for the audience to have scenes of characters, you know, being in situations where the slasher maybe could hurt them. But at this, you know, because that's, that is what we're there for, you know, that is. It's a slasher movie. We we want to see you know not only just you know people 
killed. That's part of it. But we want to see, you know, we want the, the building of suspense. We want scenes where we're like, oh, no, he's right. You know, he's right around the corner or he's already behind the, you know, the victim or whatever. And the moment that, you know, that we, the audience, know that there's a killer, especially if the, the characters also know, but, you know, then in a lot of slashers, they don't. We're like, no, don't, don't be stupid. It's, you know, there's a killer there. It's, yeah, it's, it's... It's pretty thankless work. It's it's a really difficult balance to, to tread, and it only gets harder the more slashers come out. And you know, in the eighties, we the market was pretty saturated. So yeah. There are a number of in jokes, and again, a lot of them just don't fit several cameos one that's truly inspired but they do tend to kind of pull you out of yeah and the the humor now is you know i already mentioned that you know it should be the satire but in this it tends to be slapstick and caricatures and i mean you lose track of how many pe how many times characters. I mean, I already mentioned how you know, yeah. Some that's that's again part of why the characters aren't that memorable. They're they're kind of one note, but yeah, you you lose track of how many times someone drops something, someone slips and falls, someone like you know jumps over nothing. You know, again, Scooby-Doo. And yeah, it just it it feels so alien to the first two and to the fourth one. And it really doesn't have the energy of the first one. And yeah, the the It does again comment on the relationships between media, youth, and violence. And there are some creative kills. And this focuses more on the the humor than the violence because of you know Columbine had just happened. But if they hadn't tried to push this out so so quickly, then it wouldn't have been a problem. They should just have waited until you know things had calmed down. I, I completely understand. I mean, if Scream 1 had come out right after Combine, you know, very close to Combine, that, yeah. But, yeah, they should just have waited. You know, they, they do it right in the fourth one, and not because they waited so long, but, that you know, that's not why it's right, but, you know, the, it, it doesn't really lose much by being you know, but anyway, I already did re review the fourth one, so, and I don't expect to be re-reviewing it, it's that, you know, the trilogy here I actually have on VHS, but, yeah, being made so long after Columbine, yeah, it's, it's just as bloody and violent and scary as it's, you know, as the first two Scream movies. And it's it's kind of, you know, it's a long movie and it's just too slow. Some have said that it's like two hours. I, it is possible that I have a different version, but again, I feel like it's people exaggerating. Not counting the end credits, it's, you know, an hour and 47 minutes. And if you do count them, it's an hour and 53 minutes, so... You know, I mean, an hour and 40-some minutes, that's, you know, perfectly, but, yeah, you know, there is, yeah, it definitely, it has s slow patches, and, yeah, and, you know, 
a lot of you know the the tone is gone and while irony has not yet completely been replaced with coincidence it's just it's still lost a lot I've reviewed other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.